to highlight these loops. I think I should have in included them on the first lecture, but uh, well, it wasn't too much. As I knew that the first lecture there would be so many um, questions and and disturbances, so I didn't put too much content there. By the way, um, I just needed to confirm something. Um, the logical XOR for for Python, the actual symbol is this one. Okay. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but that's the actual symbol. I think in your notes we had this one. I suppose this one, I, well, maybe you can use it um, just in the same way as someone was, uh, was proposing the use of the W equals to sign for end, but the actual symbol for the logical X is that one. Okay, so I just need to confirm that before we proceed. Um, and in terms of sharing the notes, for you to use them during the, the lecture, um, sharing the notes, well, uh, maybe we'll just be running sections of code, um, but just a second. Okay, I'm um, sorry about that. So let's proceed. Um, then the next thing, uh, sometimes you want to be able to control how the program is going to be executing. So we have these loop, looping statements and conditional statements. Okay, loops, they allow us to uh, <coughs> execute a, a few lines of code over and over again. Okay, so um, this, these are statements that allow us to execute some instructions repeatedly. So this, in other words, we're talking about iteration. We, this is um, useful um, if you have maybe to want to control how execution is supposed to be done. Um, so for this uh, section, we have the for loop. Um, it's, it's a statement. So the for statement, in other words, is a keyword um, that, that is used to um, repeat a, a finite number of times, which you can, you, 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 you are familiar with. Okay. So, <clears throat> and we also have the while loop, it does the same, only that the syntax is different. And then we also have nested loops which is a for loop contained inside another for loop. Okay, so <clears throat> let's let's talk about that. Um, for the first uh, the first type, the for loop, we have the, the, the example here, for later in data analytics, print uh, the current letter is, and then later. What are we saying there? Uh, we are saying for every instance of, of, L, of a, of 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 of, uh, of character inside our string data analytics do something okay so um is later a keyword let's 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 try to say for late in uh, uh for, for that in data analytics 
you can see that still our program is running. So or we can even say for L in data, uh, then print L. Okay, so uh, you can see that this one is not a keyword, but the keyword here is for, okay? And the in is also a keyword, it's, an, it's a recognized value in our programming language. So we're saying for every instance, this one will obviously be a, 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 a character, which is because this string is made up of characters, okay? So we're saying for each character inside the string, you want to print that character. That's what this block of code is actually saying, okay? So um, one thing I want you to note is we also indented the code here. If we maybe reduce the spacing there and we try to run, you can see it's still running, okay? But the only wrong case is when we don't have any space. Here I just put one space and that code was correct. But for the sake of readability, you might put more, more than just one space, okay? Um, and also just take note of the colon there. Make sure that after the for loop, you put the colon and then there won't be any brackets there necessary. Okay, and then um, we want to be able to display the current letter. So when, so something is happening for every condition that satisfies L, which means for the first condition, L is equal to D, okay? So when L is equal to D, print, is equal to D, print the value of L. When, and then when that has happened, we move on to the next condition where L is equal to A. And when L is equal to A, what is going to happen? Print the value of L, which is now A. So every time it encounters a condition, you can see the, for the value for D, you can see that we have D there. And for A, the current letter is A, and so forth, until um, we are through with that, with that, um, with that string. So that's how the for loop works. It has a finite number of conditions for which it's supposed to do some execution. <coughs> so, um, or perhaps even not so finite, perhaps a range of condition values. The for loop is, is, is ideal, okay? Um, especially when the range of values is quite big, you can just make use of the for loop, okay? When you have, uh, but ideally, oh, but certainly you should have a finite number of conditions um, because if the for loop is not supposed to execute, um, for example, someone may might just say ignore it for L. Um, ah, okay, for ah, okay, maybe for now we not talk about that. All right, um, then we have the the range function. Okay, I think I talked about the range function. I think I should have put it um, there. Maybe let me move it up a bit because we want to use it in our um, in our code. Okay, we have a function called the range function. And this function, it returns a sequence of numbers starting from zero, increment, by default it increments by one, and stops before a specified number. So, the syntax of range is start, stop, and step, okay? Um, so uh, we can say for, suppose here, you can see in this particular example where we have the for loop, we are saying for X in a range one to 10, we have defined a range of values and the default step here is, is one, okay? So we're saying for X is equal to one, X is equal to two, X is equal to three, X is equal to four, and so on. We want to print the value of, X, okay. But remember we said it um, stops before a specified number. So you'll see that in our in this case, we have printed one to nine, okay. So we make use of the range function in, com in combination with uh, the for loop for us to be able to, to print um, in a range of values, okay. So this time I want to be a bit faster. Uh, I don't know if that's okay with you. All right, so, um, 
is the space a letter? Okay, of course, it's not a letter, but it's just a character which is included in the string. That's why also it is also recognized. It won't be, it won't be omitted. So you, you saw that when we printed, the space was also there. Okay. Uh, I'm rejoicing that she cannot see my screen. Maybe what you need to do is to try and reconnect. It might be bandwidth. Okay, sorted. All right, fine. Uh, the notes, maybe let me share the notes. Um, how can I share these notes conveniently and quickly? Maybe let me also... Okay, let me send to David Yoni at gmail.com. Okay. I'm sending to David Yoni. So I'm posing the lecture for the sake of sending the notes. Yeah, I, I want to be a bit faster. <laughs> Someone had already noticed that this time. Okay, I won't be too fast, of course. I'll just maintain a, <laughs> a pace which is good enough for us um, to finish quickly, but also for us to understand. Okay, um, I, I, well, someone said then, because I, I mentioned that I want to edit something on the course outline, so I'll, I'll send the course outline as soon as I finish that. Okay, then what else do I want to? Okay, so I think we can proceed now that I've sent the notes. Have you received them, David? Have you received them, David? Okay, David has received the notes and you probably received them from him. Okay, so that's fine. All right, so um, so we have this loop for L in data analytics. So I was saying this the space there is also recognized as a character. So although it's, it means a blank character, but you can see that in the output is also appearing. And then we have also created a range which is ranging from one to nine. And we want to print that range, and that range is being printed as well. We also have the while loop, which we declared a variable called count, which is equal to one. And we're saying while count is less than six, we put our colon, and we say print the value of count. And after every time, what is happening is every time after printing the value, we're going to increment that value of count by one. This is equal, so as we mentioned before, this is equal to count is equal to count plus one. So in other words, we print the value of count um, for the first condition where count is equal to one, okay? And then after printing the value of, of count, we're going to increment that value to, and then it will be equal to two. Okay, so when count is equal to two, what happens? We will move out of the loop and we go back to, to, this, to this line and we check if this condition still holds. If it still holds, 
then we print again the value of count, which is then equal to two, and then we increment the value of count by one, okay? And then after incrementing to three, we, we, we move out of the loop and we check again to see if that value of three is, is, is true for this condition, okay? That is the same thing that we're doing for the for loop. We say in range one to 10. So um, when X um, is equal to one, then we the, the, the value of X is printed, okay? Then um, the value of X is incremented. Um, this time in the for loop, the increment operation is not stated explicitly, but it is just how this range function is, this function is, is designed. There's going to be a range of values where there's an automatic increment operator. Okay, um, that's how the range function is designed. So from well, for the value of one, then um, the increment operation is, is executed and X is now equal to two. Then when X is equal to two, enter the loop again, print the value of X again. Okay. So that's how this loop is um, going to be executed. Okay. So we have the for loop there, the while loop there, and we have another example. Um, this time I was saying for I in X, in other words, for every instance of the range function, so range will be, range. our range this time is three comma six. So range will then be three and four and five. Okay. So for every instance of that, we want to, because of three comma six there, we'll say the, the lowest value of that range is three and the highest value is six minus one, which is five. So we're saying for every instance of that from the range function, um, print the value of, of, of that instance, and then you can see the output is what we have there. So maybe I should move this so that we have two examples for the for loop. All right, um, then here is an example of a nested loop. We have for G in range one to six, and inside that for loop we have another for loop for K in range one to three, and then we say, print okay um so what is happening there uh okay the name is is possible to automatically allow people to join i just said Oh, so David is asking, so by default, it goes to print the next character in the next line. Yes, by default, it goes to the next line. Okay. Um, okay, um, let's proceed here. We are explaining the for, the nested for loop uh, for G in range one, two. So this is why we can say one to five, okay. Um, we have another nested for we have another loop for loop inside that for loop we have another loop there for loop and we're saying for k in range one to two okay so in other words g is equal to one and it's equal to two or to three let's just try that g is equal to one two three four five okay and we're saying in this particular case we have k equal to one and two. Okay, so what happens is for those who have never not um, met a nested loop before, what happens is you have the instance where g is equal to one. When g is equal to one, what's going to happen? We enter the loop and we start executing the code that is inside the loop. What code is inside the loop? We have this loop where we want to check uh for k is equal to one and k is equal to two so inside that for loop the nested loop we are going to have a case where k is equal to one okay and when k is equal to one what happens we are going to print um a variable here 
and the variable there, percent of D times percent of D is equal to percent of D. So we are going to print one times one is equal to the value of one plus one, one times one. And you can see I was saying percent G, K, G times G. Okay, what you are saying is um, we're replacing these, um, these um, placeholders with these values, okay? Um, so we are going to print one times one is equal to, and we're going to print two times two is equal to, okay? Um, so that's for the case where, um, and in this case, we said I is equal to one. And for that case where I is equal to, for sorry, G is equal to one. For that case where G is equal to one, there is going to be a case where we have uh, G times K, which is one times one. And then there's going to be a case where G is equal to one times two, because we have K ranging from one to two. So you can see that we have G for, for when G is equal to one and K is equal to one, we have one times one. And for when G is equal to one and K is equal to two, you have one times two there, okay? So that is how that is going to be executed. And so when K is no longer equal to two or is no longer in the range, in this range, then the execution of this nested loop is going to end. And then we're going to enter the outward, outside loop again for the case where um, G is equal to two. And then we're going to have two cases again inside the nested for loop for G is equal to two times one for the first uh, range of K and G two times two for the second range of K, okay? And so forth. That's how these nested for loops are going to, to be executed. I think there was a common problem that we used to solve in, in, in class whereby you'd be asked to solve such a problem like this um, using a, a for loop, okay? You'd have perhaps a, a series of stars that's incrementing to whatever the number of stars that you want to print. And you'd be asked to print those stars using these loops. So you can just try that at home um, during your own time. Uh, sorry. Um, so you can, oh, everything is disappeared. Where is, where is my loops? All right, so <clears throat> that's what we have for the for loop, just for practice. To make sure that you've understood the for loop, you can just try to write, to print those stars using, um, don't know if there are any questions um, concerning what we've done so far. Um, SPHW, I don't know how, what, what your name is. You saying you can see where I'm, my notes, you can see my screen, the one that I'm explaining. Um, I don't know the other guys with the, what, can you see my screen, the one that contains the notes? The other guys, can you see the, the screen with the notes right now? Yes, we can We can see it clearly, sir. Okay, okay that's fine. Thank you. So it means, um, who's this? Um, Guys, who said they cannot see my screen? There is SPHW in there. <laughs> I'm not sure who that is in my tumble. You can, there's something, it's something to do with your settings or your, your perhaps your, your, your network. Okay, More, you, most likely it's the network. All right, um, then um, <clears throat> we have decision making statements. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes you want to make decisions based upon uh, the outcome of a condition, okay? So these decision-making statements, they allow us to do that. As we were saying before, that we do have expressions that can be evaluated to either true or false, okay? 
there are expressions that can be evaluated to either true or false. So sometimes you want to be able to handle those conveniently. Okay, so we do have um, these decision making statements that allow us to do that, such as if, else if, the, the end if, also have the end if, I, I didn't put it there. And then the nested statements, again, like we had. So um, <clears throat> we the following conditions can be used. <clears throat> and the, the, we, the operators that we have is this one. This one, we, we you, you see this time we are having double equals to sign. The, 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 for those of us who have never encountered this, this time we are, we are checking if A is equal to B. So if you are checking and not assigning, the value of a to b we put w equals to sign and if we're checking if a is not um, equal to b we check with the with this with this sign so this one means equals to is it equals to sorry um is it equal to and this one is it not equal to and this one um is a we want to check is a less than b and this one we want to check is a less than or equal to b and here our check is is a greater than b and here our check is is greater greater than or equal to b okay so we need these conditional uh, operators for use with our if statement okay here we are assigning a is equal to to, to 50 we are saying a is equal to 15 it's an assignment okay <laughs> and in other words we are assigning the value of 15 to the variable a and want to check if we want to check if a is greater than 15 then we have here we have our statement if a is greater than 10 then if it's greater than 10 print a is greater so you can see that in this case a is actually greater than 10 and the result is a is greater than 10 but if for example you have a is equal to 1 and you run that you see there's nothing coming out which means um since you are the programmer you'd know that it means that um <laughs> a is not greater than 10. and then when we include the else statement that's where you have you want the, your, your your output to be to be more interactive here i should have had an else statement so that if this condition does not hold then something else would happen we should be informative to me because here I'm not sure whether the code is run or it's not running, but because I know that A is not greater, I know it's running. But in the case where you want maybe to 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 have more than um, one, um, to to maybe to have um, another condition that is going to to have a, a, a result from that other condition or alternative condition you can use the else statement. So it's like a default condition. Because every other is a condition, the only other condition is A is less than or equal to B. Okay, so <clears throat> um, in this case, we are saying in every other condition, we're going to print B is greater. So A is 15, B is 20, and in this case, B is greater than, than A. As you can see by mere comparison. So if we run that, we are having B is greater, is greater. But if we make A greater than B, you can see that we now have A is greater. Okay. So that's how the else statement works. But there are cases where we have many multiple other conditions. Okay. Like here, I have, suppose I they can be equal. So what if they're equal? Um, I, I, this time I, cho I chose to use an equality condition, an equality condition, okay, to say if, L if, in other words, we're saying else if A is equal to B, do something. Else, which is any other condition, then just print B is greater, okay? So if you run that, you can see that we, our, our code is correct. I'm not sure if both are equal is correct English, but <laughs> that's what we have. Okay. And then um, the nested if, uh, here we are, we are declaring a variable x, which is equal to one. 
we have an if statement. And we're saying if x is equal to, is greater than 10, we're going to print that x is greater than 10. And if it's greater than 20, we should print that it's also above 20. Um, otherwise, if it's not greater than 20, print it's not above 20. You can see that the positioning of this else statement is telling us that this else is referring to this if statement and not to that one, okay? Because these two, are this if, this else and this if, or this else and this if, they are in the same line, okay? So this if and this else, they are referring to, the, to each other, okay? So this if and this else are also referring to each other, okay? So if we run that, um, you can see, if x is greater than 10, print is above 10. Um, here I, I have, maybe we can, we can have x is 16 and you'll see that if it's greater than six than 10, we're told that it's above 10. And if it's greater than 20, we are told, we would be told that it's above 20. Otherwise, tell us that it's not above 20. Okay. And also, if it's not above 10, you can tell us that it's not above 10. So that's how these nested if statements work. And then we have the loop control statements. And these ones are used to change execution from normal sequence, okay? They're used to change execution from its normal sequence. Um, usually we use these in, in conjunction with our Okay, usually we use these in conjunction with our loop statements. Um, <clears throat> the break statement used to exit a while loop or a for loop. It actually terminates the loop and transfers execution to the next statement after outside of that loop. The continuous statement, it causes the looping to skip just for this particular condition, okay? and go to the next condition. While the difference between the two is this one will terminate the loop. This one will skip the current condition and move to the next loop. This one is like the continuous statement, only that it just doesn't do any, it just doesn't do anything, okay? Um, so um, here we have an example. We are saying while count is less than or equal to 100, we want to print the value of count and we increment the value of count by one. And we're saying if count is greater, is greater than or equal to three, then break. Okay. So if the condition where count is three, the, the loop, this whole while loop should stop execution. Okay. Um, or we can say if while if count is greater than, um, than uh, 10, you'll see that, uh, is when, when we come to the condition where uh, the loop is equal to 10, it's going to break up con, con, uh, execution. Um, for x in range 10, uh, if x modular 2 is not is equal to 0, continue. All right, now here I think we've introduced something else that we had not talked about. Uh, <clears throat> this is that is this um, symbol there. This is the modular sign, okay? And the modular sign, we make use of it if we want to extract the remainder in a division. So maybe let's just say um, x is equal to five. What is x divided by two? Um, it's 2.5. In other words, we have a, a remainder when we do that 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 um, division, okay? And that remainder it's uh, is two remainder one, okay? So that's why we have so that's why we have the point five there. But if we want just to extract the remainder, okay, we can use the modular sign instead. Um, where is it? So if I say x modulus two. It's just giving me one, which is actually the remainder 
of that division. Okay, so that's what we are doing there. For every value of x, you want to see the remainder. So um, when x is equal to one, what is one divided by two? Okay, so for that, and then when x is equal to two, what is two divided by two? Well, when x is equal to three, x divided by 2 would be 3 divided by 2. Okay, and the remainder. And so we have the if x multiplies 3 is equal to 0, then print the remainder. Okay. That's uh, sorry, print um, the value of x. So, in other words, print for those conditions where we um we also want to check in other words we want to check whether x is even okay um and for us to do that we are saying where we we don't have a remainder just continue i think it would have been more useful for us to print the even numbers than to print um it will be more useful to print the, the even numbers than to print the um, in other words we can say we want to print the even numbers okay but it's just that we wanted to demonstrate the use of the continuous statement okay but that's how we can extract the um so when it's even, to move on to the next. And then, so in this particular case, we're just printing the odd numbers. If X is even, continue. But if it's not, then print the number, okay? So that's what you have for the for that continuous statement. So you can see that when X is equal to two, two divided by two is equal to zero. Uh, the modulus of, of that division is, in other words, the remainder of two divided by two is zero. So for the case where, two, where for the case where x is equal to two, nothing is going to happen. And then when x is equal to three, three divided by two um, is going to give us um, a remainder. So the value of x in that particular case is going to be printed when x is equal to three. We're starting from x is equal to one actually is uh, i had mentioned one divided by two okay and then for five when five divided by two it gives us a remainder and so when x is equal to five uh, we are going to print the value of x that's the continuous statement and then the past statement is i mentioned um i said if letter is equal to a so when A, what's going to happen? We're just going to print uh, the pass block. So you can see that it is really similar to what we have um, with the continue. But in this particular case, when uh, we encounter the pass block, something we, we, um, we have a case where we might be interested in just doing something. Okay, that's the pass block and then um this particular case we have two conditions on either side of the logical operator and so because of these two conditions um <clears throat> you can see that is going to either evaluate the whole expression is either going to evaluate to true or false so if it's true if the whole expression value is to true, then what this is going to be printed. So as I was mentioning before, we have to check for this condition first. Is A greater than B? This is going to result in either true or false. And this is going to result in either true or false. So the logical end operator is going to do that logical operation of where, whereby is going to say if this is true and that one is true as well, then the resulting value is going to be true. 
Okay, so I think you can remember that from what we were talking about previous time. All right, and then <clears throat> the uh, and then the O operator as well. Um, if this expression follows to true, or that expression follows to true, print at least one of the conditions is true. Just for for you, for you, just to help you familiarize with what we're doing previously. Now, here's a simple example that I want you to try. Uh, if the NSF is more than 50 cars, then his commission is 5% of his salary. Otherwise, he has no commission. Now, I want you to look at the world in the eyes of code. To the eye, the same eyes that the programmer uses <laughs> to look at his world, okay, or her world. Um, <clears throat> here, it's a simple real life scenario, but I'm saying you should express it in terms of code. Is anyone, can you know, can you just try that in your notebook and share your response with, with anyone? Just try it in a Jupyter notebook to implement this. What, how would you implement this in code? Okay. Let's try it quickly. Is this a difficult question? Any, any responses? Is it a difficult question? <laughs> All right, maybe you just try that during your own time. I'm sure you'll come up with something. All right, and then now I want to talk about containers. There are some containers um, that which uh, allow us to store some co some 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 data, including lists, dictionaries, sets, and and tuples. So these are the ones that you want to talk about specifically in this particular in this particular case i want to talk about these um lists dictionaries sets and tuples okay um so we just want to do it as as quick as we can what um, is a list object so a list is an ordered collection of zero or more references to python data objects and they are written as comma delimited values and closed in square brackets. And the empty list is that is, is given by that. So we are saying it's just a collection of, of, of references to data objects. So in other words, it's just a collection of, of, value, of the values, okay? um which can be any value okay and so you can see here we've created a list and we we called it my list and the values that is storing are one three two six point five and eight so that is our first list okay and this is just the same as to say print that list okay and when we print that list you see it's just giving us that Okay, and then there are lists, there are operations that we normally want to uh, implement on these lists. Okay, so you can take note of that. There are these operations that we normally want to involve with these lists. 
Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, why they allow us to manipulate this list in such a way that we can do some pre some some normal functions operations um, quickly, such as indexing, concatenation, repetition, membership, length, and slicing. Now, one thing that we want to note is that the index 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 position, the first index position in our list is going to be zero. It's just like we had for the for the previous examples. And then the slice operation returns of okay. Um we'll talk about the slice operation. Um Okay, uh, so here we have created a list. And for, for us to create this list, my list, we have created it as six times of uh, six times this is zero correct value. Okay, so our list is made up of six zeros. So when we said print my list, you can see that we have returned a, a list of, of zeros. Okay, now output. And then my list is equal to one, two, three, four. Um, and A is equal to my list times three. In other words, we're going to have this list being repeated three times inside of our list. Because the list itself can store any type of data, okay? Um, and we have the, the, okay, so then we printed A afterwards. And then we, we said my list two is equal to 45. In other words, we're altering the second value. This is zero, one, two. So we're saying that value at index position two should be 45. And when we change that value, you can see that what we have is that. Okay, okay are we together? I hope was, we're together. For now, are we together, class? All right, um, so someone provided the code. Uh, I said S is equal to 50. It's F, if S is equal to, is greater than 50, print uh, five commission, 5% five commission and else print com no commission end. Okay, so thank you for, for that. Um, maybe, uh, let, let me just um, put it there. That's the solution that was proposed. Um, so what's the error there? Okay. Indenting. So you can see that the code is correct. Um, but now, I, that's another question. Did I ask a question? Okay. Uh, okay, I, I think I corrected. Thanks for the correction. And then I asked the question based upon this. What was the question? Well, actually, maybe I don't. Oh, I said, are we together for now? Are we together? All right. Thank you. Um, someone said not on the last part. Which part is that? So, can you just try to to redo the last part? If my print two is goes to forty five, I think I was lost on that side. Okay. What you are yes. doing in this one? I think you are talking about this part. Okay. Um, what we are doing in this case is we are assigning, okay, so maybe instead of indexing, we can actually say it's assigning a value using index position. We are assigning a value using the index position, okay. This list, you can create them using, um, so this is um, the index position that you are referring to. Okay, so we're saying at position two, the value at position two in, in my list, 
of which this is my list. And the value at position two is that one. Remember, our index position started zero. So this is the value at position zero, the value at position one, the value at position two. In other words, we can create a list. Um, we can call it list two. Okay. And we can create a blank list. And then we can say list to one is equal to um hello. So what we are saying is the first um okay, sorry, list two zero is equal to hello. Uh, what is this assignment index out of range? Mm, I can, I'm not sure what this is about, but what I just wanted to demonstrate is the fact that we can make use of, of, um, of these square brackets to refer to an index position inside of a particular list. Maybe we can even say print, um, list zero okay my list you can say print my list zero um and so it's going to give us the value at it at, at that and you can do this Sorry, for every for every condition um, inside of your list. Okay, so here we don't have. Um, uh, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why we are getting these errors, but we can. Okay, maybe let's say my list one two three yeah okay. so you can see that we are making use of this index point decision to to retrieve the value at that position inside this i don't know if i've answered you i don't know if you feel that uh the question has been answered. So in other words, we are saying there's, we have the opportunity to manipulate the list through the index position of that list, okay? So I'm, I'm wait, waiting for, for, for response. Uh, So someone is saying, I'm not seeing where the 45 came from. The 45 came from this part where we assigned the value of 45 to the to the position on. So if we say, if we if we if we if we comment this out, you'll see that we won't have 45 anymore, but we have one, two, three, four. Okay. But because we had assigned a value of 45 here, that's why we are having. This forty-five there. Are we answered? Okay, now let's proceed. And then we also have other list operations that we might we can talk about, such as append, insert, pop, sort, reverse. Um this is is, is a whole list of them. So when you get the chance, you just read through them, okay? But I put some practice examples. For those of us who are familiar with these concepts, um, it won't be much of a problem, but of course, some of us have never met the meaning of the word append. But when you are saying append, we are saying we are adding an item to the end of the list. Insert 
is we are going to insert an item at the ith position. So when we're saying append, we don't need to specify the index position of that item which we are adding to the list because the index position is the default position, which is the, at the end of the list. And you cannot alter that with as append. And, but now when you want to alter the position, we have to use insert whereby we specify the index position. So at the ith position, we have insert. And if we want to remove the last item in the list, we use pop. If you want to remove an, the ith item in the list, you, you have to use pop with an argument i, which is the index position of the item that you want to remove. And if you want to sort a list, you have to, um, to use, you can use the sort function and to, to, to display the list in reverse order, you can use list.reverse. To delete an item at a particular position in the list, you can use deal, the keyword deal or the for delete, okay. You return to find the index of the first occurrence of an item, you can use the index index function. The count function returns the number of occurrences of a particular item or value. And the remove um, function, it removes the first occurrence of a particular item. So I think when you run this, you are going to see how these functions are going to be running to be executed. Okay, so that is what we have for the list. So here I created a list called my list. And then I said my list dot append. And then I printed whatever I have now inside that list. And you can see where I have my first print. Um, we do have the false at the end because of the append function, okay? <laughs> and then um, the next um, function is maybe to differentiate, you just want to differentiate the output, that's why I'm doing this. Um, we have my list dot insert, and I have two arguments there, two comma 4.5. So what am I inserting in the list? Am I inserting the value of two or am I inserting the value of 4.5 or am I inserting both values in the, into the list? Um, if you go to this, you can see that we are saying the first value is the index position. The item itself is going to be the second value. So the in the at index position two, we want to insert the value of 4.5, which is, this is zero, this is one, and this is two. So our, value for this, this the third value will now be 4.5. Um, so let's run that. You can see that instead the third value in that list is 4.5 and true has been pushed to the right. Okay, so, and then my list does pop when we want to do the pop operation. Um, so you can see from the, from the explanations that I gave them, how those functions are going to be executing. And of course, based on what I mentioned earlier, you can just, <laughs> you, you can, you can run the code and try to reconcile the nodes with the examples in the code. Okay, so is that okay? I think there are no queries there. All right, instead of us having to discuss every function, you can just do this during your own time. If you encounter any problems or you need an explanation, you can then ask during the next lecture. Okay. Then one common Python function that is often discussed in conjunction with list is the range function. And the range produces a range of objects that represents a sequence of values um, so we've talked about the range function. 
but we can use it in conjunction with the list. Um, so print range 10 is uh, the range of values from zero to 10, to nine, sorry. And then print list or range 10. And then we are saying, um, let print the range as a list, okay? So um, we have in this second print, you can see that the range of, of from zero to nine has been printed as a list, okay? Uh, and then print range five comma ten. This time we've we've limited our values to the range between five and ten, and so um, we have range five comma ten. Apparently, when we just say print range, it's just retaining the the range itself, but it's not retaining every value contained inside the range. But when we print it as a list, that's when it will return every value contained inside that 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 range. Okay, so that's why these are being used in combination. In this particular case, we are printing that range from five to 10, but with a step of two. So it's from five, we have add two, it's seven, and seven, add two is nine. Okay, and of course, the last value, which is 10, is not going to be included. So that is how the range function is just defined. So you can see that we don't have uh, a 10 anywhere, even in the list there that we have on top. And then um, the last statement, print list range 10, one minus one. This time we're counting from, from the top to the bottom. So it's uh, our, our step is a value of minus one. So we are, ex we are subtracting minus one every time we move from a particular range value okay and our step is one so we're subtracting just a single value every time yeah any questions so far any questions can we proceed <laughs> okay, some of the engines are already boiling, but now we just want to do a bit more before we call it a day, okay? But it's not too complicated. Then we have these that we call these comprehensions. And we make use of these to create new lists from other Iterable, iterable, and iterables. Okay. Um, what we have is we're going to be using those iterating, um, those statements that allow for iteration. That's, that's what we use in these list comprehensions to manipulate the list that we have. It's very popular. Um, we use them and you usually many times in your pro in programming it's very important these two concepts are very useful okay um so here we have a list a which is ranging from which has these um, values 10 21 23 11 and 24 and we're saying val plus one for val in a um so in other words, we are saying we, want, we just want to display um, the, val the value that we have in A uh, plus one. Every, for every value of A that we have in A, we want to add one to it. So that's where we have that out output there. So we are saying val plus one for val in A. We are saying for each value in A, add one, okay, to it. Add one to that file, and the output is what you have there. In other words, we see that our output is uh, another list. 
So our output is another list which is different from the first one. Um, and then in this particular case, we have created another list called results. Okay. In this particular list, we have created another list called results. Um, and <clears throat> for every value inside the original list, we want to check if the value is greater than 15. If it's greater than 15, then we are going to add that to our list called results. Okay. And so, uh, when we add that, we are going to print what we have inside our, our list. Okay, so that's what you have there. Uh, so those values which are greater than 15 are what? 21, 23, and 24. So these are the three values that are going to be added to our, our list code results. And so, um, but we don't just add the value itself, we add the value plus one, okay? So you're going to add 22, 24, and 25. That's what you have as output. Okay, so I think so far we're together. And then we have um, another list uh, A because of that. And another list results. Um, this one is just going to add everything that is, we don't have an if statement. Um, maybe it's not, this one might not be necessary. It's just adding the amount of stuff that we need to read. But um, we also have another list called word list. And in this list, we have string values. Okay. Um, another list called letter list. We're saying for a word in word list, and we're saying for a letter in, in a word. So in other words, we're going to say for each string that you have in the in the in the list. And we're in this, we're saying for each letter that we have inside that that word that we've extracted, we are going to append it to um the um so in other words, what we are doing here is we're just extracting every letter contained inside our inside our our list inside the strings contained inside the list okay this time we made use of a nested for loop for that operation okay so i have a practice question then a is equal to that a minus one a minus two and so forth. So you can do this practice. Um, and the question there, um, that is maybe what we can do, let's finish up on this list. Um, Now, I don't know if the questions. Okay, no questions. Uh, so, in addition to accessing list elements one at a time, Python provides concise syntax to access sublists. This is not a slice. In other words, we are taking, we're extracting a portion of our list and using that portion, okay, in whatever I want to do. We are using a sub portion of our list, whatever operation that you might be having. Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> slicing. Here we have a, a, 
a range that we have created. Okay. But we've at least created out of that range where we are going to we have a range that um, is spanning from zero to five. Maybe I need to put my parentheses here. So here um, we have a range that we have created. Um, so of course we have to print this as a list for us to get the specific values, I, I think I omitted to do that. And we can slice our, our list using the slice operator, which is this colon there. Here, the first slicing was saying, get a slice from index two to four exclusive. And what is going to be the output? It prints two and three is that um is that what you have um maybe let's just see where is our error yeah. Okay, um, so you can see that we have two comma three there. Okay, so that is what is being said. We want to get a slice, which is a portion of the array from the whole array, uh, oh, sorry, of the list, sorry, not the array. We want to extract a portion of the list from the whole list. And for us to do that, we are using this um, slice operator. And here we wanted uh, items from index range two to three. And so for us to do that, we said nums two, four. Okay. Um, so far, so good. All right, <clears throat> so we have another error there. Um, where is that error coming from? Um, Okay, I think it's um, this this part. Okay, so apparently um, we wanted to assign in this part. We wanted to assign a new sublist um, to a slice. Okay, but you see that we're getting that here. Um, so maybe there's something wrong with the code. But in this particular case, we're saying print get print the, the, the range of values from the value at index position two to the end of the, of the list. Um, you can run these when you get the chance, but I, what you just need to do is you just need to um, add the list. You just need to add the list there. Okay. 
And then that's what we have for what's happening. So this, in this particular case, you can see that we are printing our our list as um, as a range of values. In this particular case, we are saying uh, print this is the portion of the list from the valid index position two to the end of the list. Um, unfortunately, my comments are not displaying. And, and at this point, we're saying get a slice from the start index, which is uh, from zero to index position two minus one. Okay. Because remember, we said it's supposed to be sort of to be exclusive in a way. Okay. So you see what we have there. Okay. We have zero, comma, one. And then this one gets a slice of the whole list because this one did not specify anything for those positions. So we're going to get the whole list. And then this one, <clears throat> um, slice indices can be negative, but we can use negative uh, values for our indices. Whereby, how do these negative values work? <clears throat> How do these negative values work? Here we are saying from the zeroth uh, value to the value at position minus one. Okay, exclusive. Okay, so it starts counting minus one at the last value to the right. Okay, That's, that, that would be minus one. And so exclusive, because it's exclusive, it's going to omit that and it's going to print zero to three. Okay. And in this particular case, uh, we're supposed to assign a new sublist to a slice. Okay. Um, but you can see that we got an error there, which means it was not allowing us when we try to execute this. So just you can just go and find out if it's possible to do it to do this. Um to assign a value using the this slice syntax. Okay. Yes, you can just find out if it's possible. And then the original array. Uh, so supposed to print uh, if we had altered that, then that would have printed um, that. But because we have it's because we use the range i think it's because we use the range perhaps it's not because the the the, the error is saying the range object does not allow right my assignment but we can just check and we'll come back with uh, with a more definite um position next time all right so the next thing would be to try uh, that exercise in Jupyter Notebook. So you can try that exercise when you get the chance and there's another exercise at the bottom there. And then we also have dictionary, which is similar to what we're doing with um, the list. And after the dictionary, we'll be having um, tuples and after that we'll be having sets, okay? and also arrays. So for now, I think we can just um, call it a day because um, we've had quite a lot. Okay, and then we'll proceed next time. All right, so I don't know if there are any questions before we... I don't know if there are any questions.
Um, well, uh, Mr. Yunis also already asked me about the extra resources. They are there available on Jupyter Notebook. You can just do anything that you want with these notes. Okay, so you don't have to worry about um, about extra lessons and so forth. As long as you're able, you have your Jupyter Notebook environment, you, you can play around with what you have and see how the, 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 the effect of any 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 change in code on the result or the or the execution. Um, the attendance register this time, I suppose, it's automatic <laughs> based on attendance on. But I don't think we are using an attendance register. And then, <clears throat> where do you find the homeroom? Because maybe you want to download the recorded lectures. The link that I gave you should direct you, isn't it directing you to the homeroom? Because personally, if I open big blue button, what I have there is the homeroom for, for the lecture. So I'm I'm thinking, does it mean that you guys will, don't, are not able? Okay, so you guys are not able to see the homeroom. Uh, okay, I, I, I sorry, I made that. Uh, I All along, I thought that you were able to, to view the homeroom. Okay, so I will download those lectures for you. And then I'll share with them with you. Okay. Because for me to access this home room, I have to log in first. Okay. Um, so I thought it's, it's just a, an oversight on my part. I probably have to. Um, Google Meet, what, what do you, what? What is the issue with good Google Meet? I can upload the videos onto um, Google Classroom, if you wish. Yeah, I think it's fine. And you can just also share them on, on Google Classroom. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> okay, big blue button by my bundles. Hey. Uh, on Google Meet, the bandwidth usage is better. Now, okay, if you uh, if you are declaring about the bundles, what will you the other option is for you just to view the videos? Okay, you will just then view the videos that I'll be sharing. Um, Google Meet, I've never used it before, but of course, if you want um, other to maybe other lectures after viewing the videos, then we can use Google Meet. Okay, because we are recommended to use the policy, the policy issue. Um, I've used personally. I've used even Zoom. Um, I was using Zoom until the university recommended that we should use Google Classroom. So I personally, I don't, I don't mind. I wouldn't mind even using Zoom, but the university is, is um, emphasizing on Google Classroom. On, on sorry, on Big Blue. Okay, so I don't think that there are any other issues. So thank you for joining me. Um, I have, I, I will be seeing, I'll be seeing you next weekend, I suppose. Okay. So you can just go and practice and you can read on the rest of the lecture so that next time when we meet, you won't be seeing smoke rising. Yeah.
Okay, one thing that we can note is what we'll be doing next. Um, we'll, what we'll be doing is uh, mostly, uh, while well, someone is saying lecture two was quite difficult. Well, what we'll be doing for the rest of the course is <laughs> very similar to what we have in lecture two. So it's not difficult, but it's just a matter of, um, of familiarizing yourself with the concepts. Okay. Um, You have the, the notebook and you can go and play around with the code there to see what everything is, what all these things are all about. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, good night to you too. Then we'll meet um, next time. I'll upload, I'll probably upload tomorrow. Right now, I just, uh, I want to be able to do that. Okay. Because this video is going to is probably going to take time to to end as well, so you can check for the video to for the video tomorrow uh, because it doesn't automatically appear as soon as you finish the, the lecture. Next week we're meeting both Saturday and Sunday. Um, it's just that I had an, I had two classes. The first class um, I was supposed to see them the first weekend I saw them was last weekend, and this weekend was the second weekend. Um, so I just thought maybe I can divide the time. I, I saw them for three days, last weekend and yesterday. So you guys are meeting you starting today and next weekend. Okay. There's the, uh, the course outline is what I'm going to approach tomorrow. Okay. Together with the videos. I'll, I will give you tomorrow. How will each lecture be? I'm not sure, but how long? Okay. <laughs> we probably have just like we did today with three sessions. So most likely we'll be having three sessions as well next Saturday and probably three sessions on Sunday. Okay. So we we'll just adjust our speed based on how much we have to cover. The first lecture, I just made sure that I would, I would be slow enough to put everyone on board Okay, so it's more difficult to remain behind than to get on board. Okay, so I think I hope that strategy worked. <laughs>